Okay, so let's start. Yiri and Johan, please not that you hear me. Okay, so welcome to the ENS trauma sections webinar on chronic subdural hematomas. So we have an excellent one and a half hours ahead of us, free talks, and uh, a lot of participants I heard. So let's dig in straight away and go to the first presentation. Just a moment. Okay. You see my slides, okay? Please yes, not. perfect. Okay. So here is our outline. So we have me as the first speaker on the epidemiology of chronic subdurals. And then we have two Swedes, Yiri and uh, Johan. And Yiri is talking about surgical management and uh, Johan about the endovascular management of chronic subdurals. So the first talk is actually each talk is going to be about 25 minutes plus a five minute discussion. And you can post your questions on the question and answer section of the Zoom. So, and of course, you can leave some questions to the very end of the talk also. And please try to keep your mics muted so all the talks go smoothly. So straight away to the, my talk on the numbers on chronic subdural hematomas. So my talk is going to be quite wide, not so very deep on the topic, but I'm trying to, going to try to give a, a very like, good overview on the numbers on what's happening on chronic subdurals currently. So here's this content of my, my talk. So a few words about the definition and the pathophysiology and also about some demographics and about recurrence complications and uh, gross outcome figures and something on, on uh, the financial impact of chronic subdurals also. So there's a large pile of literature from Finland uh, on this topic, fortunately. So there's actually three uh, doctoral thesis done in Finland during the last few years. So. The first one is from Minna Rauhala, who I supervised. The other one, actually, I uh, acted as a, as a reviewer from Oulu, uh, from Anna-Lena Heula, and the third one from Helsinki from this year on chronic subdural. So there's a lot of literature from Finland on this topic. And uh, the main body of my talk is basically focused on these books and the literature on these. So about the definition very shortly on it. So everybody basically knows that the chronic subdurals are considered an encapsulated old collection of blood and blood like in products, the degradation products. And uh, chronic in the literature is cited as the hematoma that's over three weeks old. So acute ones are within the first three days and subacute from three days to three weeks. And of course, these are more considered in the cases that have a, a trauma background where you can actually say that there's some kind of in initiation of the hematoma. But then in, in the chronic ones, you know that there's many times the trauma history is unknown or even missing completely. But this is something that's in the background three weeks as, an, as a timeline for chronic subdurals. And the history background is noted in 50 to 80% of the cases, the rest are considered spontaneous, but to be honest, we don't know for sure that they are spontaneous. Maybe there's some very minor, very minor, minor head injury in the background that the patient doesn't even remember about. Of. So maybe there's a true spontaneous one, but it's, it's debatable. About the, about the physiology of chronic subdurals, the very true exact mechanism is, is currently still unclear. There's a lot of theory on it. And uh, in the history, the bridging veins and tearing of the bridging veins was the main focus 
and uh, I think it's still in the in the equation of what's the physiology and the background of chronic subdurals. But nowadays, it, nowadays it's mainly it's talked about that there's a tear in the dural border layer of uh, of the dura. So here you can see in the image there's certain layers within the dura and the very base layer, which which is just under above the arachnoid space is the dural border layer that the tear is within there. So if you would be very exact, it's it's basically it's an intradural hematoma, not a subdural hematoma to be precise. But we we speak about subdurals, of course. But that's the main idea of the background that that space somehow tears and and the collection of the old blood products actually goes there and starts from there. Uh, everything in life seems to be about inflammation. So inflammation is part of the process. So uh, the cascade where it actually it starts and how it develops, it isn't very precisely known, but this is the main idea on the background that there's some kind of injury in the dura and inflammation starts and membrane formation in angiogenesis, also new vasculature and leakage of the like small small veins that are there and that the cascade starts that the uh, resorption of the fluid isn't enough uh, in contrast to the development of fluid and then uh, eventually a, so a large hematoma develops uh, this isn't, isn't exactly pathophysiology but uh, just to note that there's a lot of uh, literature on different types of chronic subdural hematomas and uh, characterization of these and CT classifications. And uh, we don't actually know, do these present a certain type of hematoma or, or, or are these actually certain phases of the hematoma itself? And what's the temporal evolution of a typical chronic subdural hematoma is also a bit unclear, to be honest. And these classifications of the CT characteristics have been used in, in prognostic models of uh, subdural hematoma recovery and also recurrence. But it seems that the evidence isn't so clear on which type is the most prone to recurrence. There's some evidence that the hybridins one is more prone to recurrence, but some say that the trapecular form is more prominent to recurrence. We don't know, to be honest. How about the numbers, the demographics of the chronic subdurals? Where are we currently? So the incidence has increased significantly during the last decades. So it, it used to be about two to 100,000. Currently during the last years, it has even nine times the number. So the recent numbers from Finland or are the mean is 18 per 100,000, so a very, very high growth in the numbers. Of course, some of the increase has to be explained by the advances in medicine. So we have more CT scanning available, and also maybe the, the patients and families are more eager or keen on actually sending some elderly cases or, or patients to the emergency part, department. So the threshold to seek med medical care may be a bit lower nowadays. So there's a lot of different aspects what actually affect the epidemiology numbers. So th there's not maybe a true incidence increase, but there is an increase, but not everything in the increase can be just explained by the increase in numbers of cases. Uh, the average age, age of a typical chronic subdural patient has also increased. So it's, it used to be plus 60 years of age, the main, main population of cases. Now it's plus 70 or even plus 80. And uh, there seems to be a male dominance and it has continued during the last decades. So over 60% of the cases are male. Here you can see some numbers from Finland. So uh, here's a spread out of different age groups of chronic subdural hematoma patients uh, and uh, certain time phases from 1990 to the recent years. So the 
most significant increase in the incidence is in the very elderly cases. So plus 90 and, and plus 80, where the increase is very, very rapid. And if you look at the numbers here in the bottom, the, in the beginning of the study phase and uh, during the last years, so it was 11 or 12 and now it's over 100. So in the 19, 90 years plus group, it's very, very steep the increase. And uh, the same is evident in the 80 plus age group also. But it, it's, it seems that the incidence in the young and middle age is quite stable and also quite stable in the 60 to 69 years age group also. So here you can also see a different uh, figure on the distribution of certain age groups. So here you can easily see how uh, the dominance of the elderly has increased during the last year. So these bottom figures are representative of the younger age groups. They seem quite same in size, but the bottom upper part portions have increased significantly. So the elderly ones are the increasing group in incidence. If you think of the background of these cases, uh, what kind of a comorbidity they have, and here you can see from a study of ours that if you compare the uh, chronic subdurals that were operated and the conservative treat, treated cases, there isn't a lot of uh, uh, a large difference between these cases and uh, comorbidity, but the most prominent diseases seem to be cardiovascular ones, also diabetes and dementia, and some cerebrovascular diseases and the chronic alcohol abuse seems to be quite frequent in, in this patient population. Also, if you think about the typical symptoms of a chronic subdural hematoma patient, these symptom characteristics seem to be quite stable during the last decades. These haven't changed. So the most prominent symptom is uh, hemiparesis and then postural instability and also memory impairment and uh, general malaise and headache. And uh, then aphasia and seizures are quite uncommon as also are nausea and vomiting. So very typical symptoms and signs of chronic subdural hematoma patients. It seems that if the, there is a true trauma history, the most common injury mechanism is a ground level fall. So 70 to 80% of the cases sustain their injury during a ground level fall. About the blood thinners in the background, uh, 20 to 30 percent of the patients are on antiplatelets and anticoagulants a bit lesser figure so 10 to 25 percent if you look at the literature and uh, how about um, hematoma laterality so bilateral is seen in 15 to 25 percent of cases uh, it differs on what kind of study cohort you're looking at but the Main number is somewhere in between like 20% of the cases have bilateral hematomas. Most commonly, the patients have a very good GCS at admission. So over 80% have 13 to 15, many have 40 to 15 at admission. So if you think about the general accepted risk factors to the development of chronic subdurals. Trauma, of course, is one of those. Uh, older age, also male gender seems to be a risk factor. What's the reason for that? We don't know for sure. Also blood thinners are risk factors and uh, also cerebral atrophy. So the cranium contrast to the cerebral volume, if there's a mismatch in that, so you have a lot of, lot of brain mass decrease, there seems to be a more dominance to sustain a chronic subdural hematoma. Also, certain conditions where you have lower ICP uh, can actually increase your risk 
to have uh, having a chronic subdural hematoma that's related to shunts if you have overdrainage and also conditions where you have uh, intracranial hypotension like uh, cerebral spinal fluid fistulas in the spinal canal or something else like that. How about recurrence and the basic numbers on this? It is generally accepted that the recurrence rate is between 10 to 20%. There are some studies that have a recurrence rate of even 30 to 40%, but uh, the main body of literature says that it's uh, somewhere between 10 and 20. And uh, the majority of recurrence actually happens within the first two months after the initial operation. And uh, the risk factors for recurrence, there's a lot of literature on this, but the consensus seems to be lacking on, on a like very good set of risk factors, but these three, three characteristics seem to be quite consistent in the literature. So if you have a large amount of intracranial air post-op, that seems to increase the risk also some CT characteristics, especially the hematoma volume. If, if you have a very, very large hematoma with a midline shift, that seems to have a high risk of recurrence and also not straight related to the patient or the hematoma characteristics is an operational detail as if you use a drain that also has an effect on recurrence, but Yiri will talk more about that. How about complications? Uh, we very often think that it, it's a very benign disease and the procedures that we do are very benign. It seems to be true. So like acute surgical complications are quite rare, one to 3%. Uh, but the subacute secondary complications are, are more frequent uh, and uh, about 15% suffer like pneumonia, or embolisms and uh, like more subacute stuff. And these are very like condensed to the elderly patients. Here you can see from our finished study, some rates of complications. If you look at the very acute complications like seizures, uh, the numbers are for seizures in total, like about 6%. And uh, there's not a significant increase in seizure rates if you look at the age groups. Uh, acute subdural hematomas are quite rare in 1%. Uh, Intracerebral hematomas even rarer. And infarcts as rare as ICH. Uh, surgical site infections about 3%. Empoema about 2%. Uh, pulmonary embolism quite rare under 1% and pneumonia about 3%. And if you look at the rates, it seems that uh, the recurrence, if the hematoma recurs, then the uh, risk actually increases for that complication. For seizures, you have a larger rate of seizures and also you have a larger rate of surgical site infections and also hot, like, Worse infections and also pneumonia. So it goes hand in hand. If you need more treatment, more in interventions, it increases the complication rate. So that's not surprising, but here's some figures just to think about. How about outcome, outcome and mortality? Generally favorable outcome, at least that we think. And the literature seems to also support that. If you look at the modified ranking scale from one to three, so a favorable outcome, that's actually in, at six months postoperatively, 80 to 83, 83, 85% actually reads a good modified ranking scale. And also, if you look at the more like chronic post op cognitive defects, those seem to be quite prominent. Of course, you have to consider that a lot of the elderly patients already have some kind of cognitive defect or problem beforehand, but those seem to be a bit more deeper and more problematic 
very long term after a chronic subdural operation. These uh, problems haven't been studied that thoroughly, but it's under recognized, I think, and we should take more care about these complaints afterwards because as surgeons, we many times are happy if the patient is speaking and walking and we don't, uh, we can, we can, we're not so interested in the more subtle things that are happening. If you think of predictors for poorer outcome, it seems that the ultra age elderly patients do worse. Also drains matter. And also if you, if you have a practice that you have a long post-op bed rest period, that seems to do harm to the patient. How about mortality? Uh, mortality acutely like intra-op or very soon post-op seems to be very, very rare. If there are some cases, those are considered seen in the elderly patients. And, uh, but if you look at the long-term stuff and mortality long-term, uh, excess mortality is related to the chronic subdural hematomas if you com compare them to the normal age and gender mass controls. And uh, the patient-related characteristics have a stronger association with the excess mortality than the characteristics of the hematoma itself. So it seems that the uh, patient characteristics are more significant than the hematoma itself. Uh, poor admis admission status, a very old age, alcohol abuse, if there's a non-traumatic etiology or if the hematoma is managed conservatively, seem to uh, actually carry a prognosis of a poor outcome and eventual death. If you think of the causes of diff, not surprisingly, the, the most dominant cause of diff long-term after a chronic subdural is dementia. Mm -hmm. Here are some figures also from a Finnish study on what's the cumulative relative survival ratio if you compare chronic subdural hematoma patients to uh, match controls. Here you can see a trend that there's, if time elapses after the operation or the diagnosis of a hematoma, the survival ratio goes down. Not surprising, but here you can see a clear difference if you look at age groups. So the curve is steeper in the older patients and also the curve is declining rapidly if the patient carries a lot of comorbidity. And a bit surprisingly, the patients that are managed, at least in our center, that were managed conservatively did worse long-term than the ones that were operated. Here you can also see from a Finnish national study on operated chronic subdural. So if you look at the uh, comorbidity index, the more you have morbidity in the background, the mortality rate goes higher. So the survival curve goes deeper down if you have more comorbidity in the background. And also the same thing here, if you're older, when you sustain a hematoma, your prognosis is worse. A few words about costs. So very briefly, in Finland, uh, it's quite surprisingly cheap, if I can say so, to, to treat a chronic subdural. So if you think of operated cases, the overall uh, treatment costs are a bit over 5,000 euros. This also includes the outpatient clinic follow-up. So the whole period from the diagnostics to follow-up, the end of follow-up. And if the patient had a recurrence, of course, the costs were higher, not even double. Uh, a bit under 9,000. And if you use drains, uh, the costs were lesser. And also a bit surprisingly, the most elder, elderly patient group wasn't the most expensive. So the middle age group from 60 to 79 years of age was the uh, group with highest costs. And that was mainly related to longer hospital stays. 
Here you can see a spread out of how the costs were divided. And uh, during these time periods, the total uh, cost for our hospital or healthcare system for that period. And when you look at the figure below, you can see the main body of costs comes from the actual neurosurgical ward treatment and what happens in the operation theater. And the other things are very minor compared to the whole pile of what costs are included in the treatment. If you compare the Finnish uh, costs to some something from Switzerland and the United States, in Switzerland, uh, the treatment costs three times the amount of, of what it costs in Finland. And the United States, if you look only at the acute hospitalization, and uh, it's double the amount what's in Finland. So there's the literature on costs of chronic subdurals uh, it's very scarce, so there's not a lot of literature to back these figures up and also contrast. But here's something to keep in mind that maybe we can say that it's quite cost effective to treat these even very elderly patients, but it, we haven't done a cost effective study, but it seems encouraging that the costs aren't super high in Finland at least. So to conclude, I would say that uh, chronic subdurals is a very common surgical disease with an increasing caseload, especially if you look at the growing elderly population, the amount of cases that we will see in the future is gonna go high and even higher than it is. Surgical treatment seems to be effective and is related to rather good outcomes with minor complications and uh, elderly, Chronic subdural hematoma patients are very prone to complications, including recurrence and long-term mor mor morbidity and mortality is mainly focused on the elderly cases. And we should think about how we manage these cases that actually the pre-CSDH health factors seem to actually matter more to the patient and for successful treatment than the hematoma characteristics themselves. So keep in mind that think about the background of the patient. Okay, thank you. Any comments, discussion? I so I don't see any questions in the Q and A section. How about Yiri and Johan? Do you have any thoughts or comments? Thank you, thank you for a nice talk, Timo. I think there is one or two questions now. If you look at the Q and A, I think they just popped up. Okay, so we have two that I see of. So what are methods to prevent recurrence? And the other one is how many days to drain? So what are methods to prevent recurrence? I think this goes a bit to the field of Yuri's and Johan's talk. <laughs> but uh, I guess I I'll, do you want Yuri to answer this or... Should we all actually wait after your talk to focus on this question on recurrence? Yeah, maybe that's a better idea. Maybe even if, I mean, if it's okay with you, Timu, and the uh, participants that we take the discussion at the end, even after Johan's talk, maybe that'd be easier. Yeah, because if the number of questions is, is quite minor, maybe we can handle these so we don't actually answer double or treble. The... So it seems that... Yeah, we have four questions so far. So I'll look at the questions as they come in. And well, if there's very a hot question that's very tied to the 
talk that is happening will answer that question then but if not we'll actually handle all the questions at the very end that's a, that's a good idea so i i think i'll hand the torch to you Yiri, so you can start your presentation i'll skip my sharing So let's see, I hope you can all see my screen now. Yes, perfect. All right, very good. So thank you for the introduction, Timo. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to the trauma section for letting me have this talk here today. Um, my name is Siri, and I'm one of the consultants here at the Kalinsk University Hospital in, in Stockholm in Sweden. And I've been asked to, to give you a brief overview, basically, on the topic of surgical management of the chronic subjular hematomas. <clears throat> I have uh, nothing to declare of relevance. And so my first question to you guys, everybody listening out there. So, so why is this important? Why, why should you listen to me for the next, let's say, 20, 25 minutes? So I think there are two reasons, right? The first one being that chronic subjular hematoma is the most common neurosurgical emergency procedure currently. And if you combine this with the fact that the incidence of chronic subjular hematoma is rising with an expected doubling, by 2040, I would argue that this is a very uh, important diagnosis to know about for all of us, because all of us treat these patients in our, in our daily practice, and we'll be doing so for many years to come, probably on a higher rate than we do today. And the problem with this, let's say, disease and the treatment of this disease is that the, it's basically like a minefield out there, okay? It's, it's a lot of traditions and beliefs of how things should be done and how things have been done and they probably should be you know continued being done the same way for the next 20 years years but I'm here to to challenge you a little bit uh, I would like to talk with you about the evidence okay so what's the evidence behind the surgical treatment uh, currently and I will try to go through that like step by step <clears throat> So we'll be talking very briefly about pathophysiology and epidemiology. Timu covered most of it, so, so just very briefly. Then I'll mainly focus on the surgical management of these patients. And if we have time, I will briefly uh, touch base on the surgical outcome and, and emerging therapies. So in terms of pathophysiology, uh, even here, uh, there's been some recent developments. And as Tim already mentioned, the, the, the theory these days of the occurrence of chronic subdural hematoma is still based on the fact that you should have some sort of traumatic head injury to begin with, right? To initiate the process. It's believed that this uh, head injury then splits open what's called the dural border cell layer, which you see down here. <clears throat> this in turn results in inflammatory inflammation membrane formation, angiogenesis, which in turn uh, leads to blood leakage and fluid accumulation, which sort of initiates sort of like a vicious circle, right? That propagates the buildup of the chronic subjular hematoma. In terms of epidemiology, uh, as you already heard from, from Timu, uh, the most important message here is, is the disease of the elderly. And since we are the, the incidence or number of elderly people is rising, so is the incidence of this disease, right? And this is also something that sort of we tried to look into uh, one or two years back. This is a publication from what's called the ICORIC study group. So this is a study group uh, aimed at investigation, investigating and doing research within the field of chronic subdural hematoma. Uh, it's an ENS-supported uh, initiative. And, and two years back, we, we sort of looked, wanted to look into the numbers of chronic subdural hematoma publications that are out there, right? And as you can see here, uh, from 2009 and onwards, suddenly this has become the most interesting disease in the neurosurgical community, right? And this probably has something to do with the socioeconomics and the, and, the, and, the, and the numbers of elderly people rising, as well as the incidence of chronic surgical hematoma patients. So in terms of uh, surgical management uh, and clinical presentation, um, I mean, probably all of you will agree that chronic surgical hematoma accumulation occurs over weeks to months, with the clinical presentation largely dependent on the size of the accumulation and the mass effects it exerts on the brain, right? So it's important to catch up the differences of this 
uh, of the let's say symptomatology between at least younger and elderly people and and I think Timu already uh, went through this quite well but I would just like to to further point out the that there is a significant difference and you should be aware of this when 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 trying to let's say screen for for patients with this disease at emergency rooms okay so this is a study we did in the Nordics a couple of years back a large uh, a uh, cohort of patients with chronic subdural hematomas. And we looked at the differences between the younger, those below 50 years of age, versus those that were elderly, right? And the way they presented was quite different. In elderly patients, you usually see hemi symptoms, like, for instance, limb weakness or gait disturbance, while younger patients did present with signs more resembling uh, raised intracranial pressure, such as headache or vomiting. So now that you have identified your patients, obviously the next step will decide to operate or not to operate, okay? And this is also something that's, that's kind of tricky, I'd say. Uh, I think that all of us would agree that patients with clinical symptoms related to the chronic subdural hematoma should be offered surgery, right? Uh, nevertheless, I'll argue that there is no consensus or evidence as to any radiological cutoff parameter for evacuation. Although in, in literature, often what's said is that a rule of thumb should be one centimeter, right? So if you have a hematoma that's more than one centimeter, you should consider surgery, especially obviously if the patient has symptoms, right? And most importantly, in, in this context, I'd argue that age by itself should not be a contradiction for surgery, uh, okay? Not in this patient category, at least. And this is also something we briefly looked into a couple of years back in, in the Nordics, uh, looking at patients more than or above 90 years of age versus those that were younger. And we didn't see any, uh, any differences in terms of reoperation, complication, or short-term mortality, right? So the outcome between those that are very old and those younger in this disease when treated surgically seems to be similar, okay? So now that you have decided to operate, uh, I argue that there are seven main surgical aspects that you can consider, okay? And these are the aspects, and I will try to go through them using the, the American Academy of Neurology uh, uh, evidence class um, uh, classification. And it's very simplified. Basically, class one means that the, the, the evidence level is based mainly on RCTs, like randomized clinical trials. Class two is more uh, case control studies, well-designed. Uh, whereas class three is more retrospective evidence, right? And the seven, seven bullet points or seven main surgical aspects are anesthesia, should you use local or general, burr hole versus twist chill versus craniotomy, which, why, and how many burr holes, irrigation, yes or no, and does temperature play a role, closed drainage, yes or no, and for how long, type of drainage, should you use the subdural or the so-called subgalal, also known as subperiosteal drainage, Bed rest, yes or no, and routine CT, yes or no. Okay, so let's move to the first one. And the way I will go through this is not in detail. I will not go through uh, the methodology in detail at every single, uh, let's say, topic and, and the reference I will bring up. This is up for you guys to read up when you go back home, but I will give you a broad overview, okay? So number one, anesthesia. I'll argue that general anesthesia versus local anesthesia is often a matter of local preferences or routines, probably also at your center, right? Nevertheless, there are actually two RCTs out there that, that investigated or went and, and uh, investigated this uh, topic in most, more detail. This is a study by a French group, Surf et al. from 2017, that actually did show uh, less complication and even patients that are more hemodynamically stable if local anesthesia is used, okay? And there's a more recent publication by Hestin and colleagues that just came out this year that uh, uh, was also an RCT, also class one evidence. Uh, they did not see any differences in terms of complications between local anesthesia and general anesthesia being used, but they did see uh, that the rate of the intraoperative adverse events in terms of mainly arterial hypotension is greater when used general anesthesia. Okay, so I would argue that that based on these two RCTs, if you can uh, if you can use local anesthesia, uh, it, it's to be preferred. Okay, so next next sort of main topic is the opening. 
Okay, and it's often discussed if burr hole or twist drill is better. Again, often a matter of local preferences or routines, whereas I think that we all agree that craniotomy is often applied in the more complicated cases in patients with a lot of membranes or calcifications or so on. And looking into the literature, there are three very large uh, reviews on this topic. Uh, the main one of the largest study is a systematic review back from 2014, including 35,000 patients, okay, mainly class three evidence suggesting no difference in terms of mortality, morbidity, or recurrence between burr hole and twist drill. Whereas craniotomy did show some higher complication risk than burr hole and twist drill, obviously also most often used in the more complicated cases. And even more recently, there's actually now an RCT out there. Okay, this is from 2021. It's a Belgian study, Dunrik and colleagues. Um, and all, unfortunately, although there was no statistically significant result, uh, it's still a class one evidence. And it does suggest uh, superiority of burrow or over tristrial in, uh, and craniotomy in terms of reoperation rate, at least. Okay, So what the reoperation risk was in, the, in, in this RCT was 7.6% for burrow, 13.1% for craniotomy, and 19% for tristrial. Okay, But they didn't find any significance on the multivariate analysis. So, so it was not statistically significant. Okay, and the, the profiles in terms of clinical outcome and complications were similar. So there's no solid evidence, probably burrow hole and twist drill is more or less equal, but one might argue that maybe burrow hole is, is, um, is better in some ways, at least. So if you do burrow hole, should you do one or should you do two burrow holes? I know a lot of German centers and many centers in the UK do use two burrow holes. <clears throat> Again, matter of local preference and routine. Uh, this is the latest evidence out there. It's a meta-analysis from 2019, class three evidence, suggesting no difference in recurrence, mortality, or complication in one versus two bolt when burr hole surgery is applied. So again, you can use one, you can use two, uh, but I'll argue that probably the second bolt hole might be redundant in many cases, okay? So once you decided how many burr holes you wanna do, the next logical step is the irrigation part, okay? Um, Again, irrigation versus no irrigation, a matter of local preference or routine. This is the latest review out there. It's a meta-analysis from 2018, class three evidence, suggesting no impact in morbidity, mortality, and surprisingly, recurrence as well, okay? Nevertheless, I probably think that many of you guys out there do irrigate, probably most of you. And if you do so, let me just point your attention to a study that actually came out yesterday. It's a, it's a study that we uh, done here in Sweden, and, we, and, and as I mentioned, just published. Um, what we did, we looked into whether or not temperature when irrigating has uh, a role. So what we did, we had three sites, three centers, block randomization, one-to-one, -one, um, and we randomized between using body warm, that's 37 degrees centigrade uh, temperature uh, saline versus what's called room temperature would be 25 degrees centigrade, okay? And surprisingly, actually the result was highly significant, okay? Six versus 14% recurrence difference in terms of need of reoperation, okay? So I would definitely argue that if you do irrigate, you should use body temperature irrigation. And let's move to the drainage, okay? And this is a hot topic often. Uh, drain versus no drain. I think that the standard at most centers in Europe these days is drain, especially after the landmark study from Santorius and colleagues back in 2009, uh, where they showed, uh, obviously it was an RCT uh, in favor of closed drainage for 48 hours, decreasing recurrence from 24 to 9% and a six month mortality from 18 to 9%, okay? And there's been a recent follow-up study done in Denmark by Jensen and colleagues, where they used the same type of drainage and then randomized patients between 24 versus 48 hours of drainage. And the endpoint was recurrence, right? Recurrence rate. And there was no difference. So probably one might argue if you use subdural drains, 24 hours of drainage time is enough. You don't need to go full in with 48 hours. <clears throat> but a lot of food, you will probably sit back and say, okay, so... Well, how does it work if we use a different drain types, okay? This is a study, <clears throat> a comparative cohort study, so it's a class two evidence level that we did back in 2017, comparing the regimen of three centers, 
this is the so-called subperistal drainage versus the subdural versus what's one would call the like an irrigation model. As you can see, you pump water in or saline and you pump it out as well. And what we saw between these three cohorts is that the subdural cohort did have a higher recurrence rate than the, than the other two ones, while the continuous drainage cohort had a higher complication rate. And this is, was even true when we adjusted for differences in baseline. So at least in, in, our, in our comparative cohort study, it seems that the subperistal drainage might have some advantages to the, uh, compared to the other two ones. And there's even a more recent RCT on this from Switzerland when they randomized between subdual and subperistal drainage. It's, it's um, what's called a non-inferiority trial, right? And unfortunately, the non-inferiority criteria were not met. So it was not conclusive. Nevertheless, they did see that the subperistal insertion led to lower recurrent rate, fewer surgical infections, and lower drain misplacement rates compared to the subdural cohort, okay? So there, there are some trends at least, but again, it was not significant. And they even did a, a systematic review and meta-analysis to follow up on this with the same conclusion. So mobilization, that's the next, next step. Obviously, after you've put your drain, you finish the surgery, should you do early mobilization or should you not? And actually, surprisingly, there are three RCTs on this uh, topic out there. I know that there's a fourth one, a large one from Portugal, the GetUp trial that's, that's um, I think, almost finished or finished, but the results are not out there yet. But these three ones, uh, unfortunately, they show conflicting evidence. Okay, so the oldest one by from uh, from uh, or the one from two thousand and seven, sorry, uh, actually did increase uh, show that if you mobilize your patients early, you have a higher risk of recurrence. Okay, when you look at the uh, trial from two thousand two by Nakajima and colleagues, they didn't see that. They didn't see any increased recurrence when early mobilized. And the last one, the, the newest one from Grubb and colleagues from 2010, suggests showed that the, uh, early mobilization after bullhole surgery prevents postoperative complications without increasing the risk of recurrence. Okay, so again, they, I'll argue that the that the evidence level here is is conflicting, to be honest. And final, routine CT. Should you do some sort of long term routine CT follow up? Again, it's often a matter of local preferences and routines. Nevertheless, there is now this uh, RCT, class one evidence from in the New England Journal of Medicine published 2018, where they randomize patients between a CT control follow-up or no. And as you can see, the, the outcome in terms of modified ranking scale was the same in the CT group as well as in the no CT group, while the CT group did experience a much higher Reoperation frequency. Okay, so the argument argument here is probably you don't need to do a routine CT. So in summary, in terms of the evidence level currently, uh, in terms of treatment of these patients, I argue that local anesthesia and sedation is superior in comparison comparison to general anesthesia. The two RCT studies that I showed you, burho uh, surgery is at least I'd say comparable to the twist drill. Again. This is the RCT from, from Belgium and, and also the, the large meta-analysis data on this. In burhole surgery, one versus two burhole is comparable, okay, retrospective data sets. Irrigation with body temperature is superior to room temperature. This is the RCT from, from Sweden that was just published. Although the role of irrig irrigation in general is uncertain, okay, there are no uh, higher level of evidence on this. I know there is a Finnish RCT study ongoing, so probably we'll know the answer soon. In terms of drainage, closed system drainage is Faber versus no drain. Santorio showed that back in 2009. In closed system subdural drainage, 24 versus 48 hours are comparable. This is the Danish RCT. In terms of drainage types, I'll argue that subperistal drainage is at least comparable to the subdural one. This is the, the Swedish trial, the Nordic, Nordic comparative cohort trial, and, and the, uh, also some of the trends from the, from the Swiss RCTs. In terms of mobilization, immediate postoperative mobilization might lead to high recurrence, but might also prevent complications due to immobilization. Okay, so this is the, these are the three RCTs that showed conflicting results. And finally, routine CT is not favorable. And this is the New England Journal of Medicine trial back from 2019. So in terms of complication and recurrence, and this is just very briefly, Timu went through this, um, in terms of recurrences, 
somewhere between eight to 30%, complications somewhere between zero. Okay, there are still people actually reporting zero <laughs> percent of complication, amazing, up to 25% and mortality up to 10%. But I argue that what's needed in this field is some sort of standardized outcome reporting. Okay, so how can it be that there is such a wide span on recurrence, for instance, in this disease and the treatment of this disease? This is incredible, right? So one reason could be that what is recurrence, okay? So a recurrence in this context, is it a radiological one? Is it a clinical one? Or is it a patient that actually needs reoperation? Okay, and as long as we haven't defined uh, the standardized outcome measures, the, the, it will be very difficult to do studies and compare results, okay? So this is something I, I, I highly argue is necessary in this field. And in terms of emerging therapies, there are obviously many pharmacological ones. This is a very hot topic. Uh, it's been suggested that atovastatine, tranexamic acid, and even steroids could have an effect. I'll argue there is no good evidence to support any of this use so far. And there's actually been several recent trials published on the use of steroids. I think this is one of the most uh, highly uh, cited ones by Hutchinson and colleagues, the DEX trial where they added steroids to patients post-surgery, right? And what they showed is that, that steroids did result in a decreased recurrence rate, okay? But it was an expense of a higher complication rate. So the our authors could not uh, recommend a, a, a standardized use of uh, steroids in this patient category. And then there's obviously the even hotter topic, the meningeal media embolization, but I know that Johan is gonna talk about this, so I'll, I'll skip that. So in terms of conclusion, I'd say that chronic surgical hematoma is the most frequent neurosurgical emergency procedure and will probably stay for many years to come. Uh, and although the evidence level is improving, I'll say, a high level of clinical evidence is still lacking for some aspects of the surgical management. Uh, and obviously more research and standardized reporting of outcome is needed in this field. And I would uh, highly suggest to a lot of you, I recommend recommend that you guys, I know that many of you are probably dreaming of becoming vascular neurosurgeon or, or, or similar, but I would advocate that there's a different path. And, and uh, I hope that uh, many of you will try to do some research in the field of chronic surgical hematoma. It's obviously, it's needed. And I think actually I'll stop here. Uh, very good, Yuri. Thank you. It was an excellent very evidence-based talk and and i liked it. it it gave a lot of fruit for thought we had a lot of questions on the q a section but we'll handle those at the very end and i think in the sake of time we can go ahead with the program so welcome you on to give your talk Thank you so much, uh, Timo. Uh, thank you, uh, Timo and Anna and uh, the people at the EANS for organizing this webinar and inviting me. Um, let's see, can you see my slides now? No? Maybe no? No? Okay. So, um, uh, my name is Johan Vasselius. I'm a senior interventional neuroradiologist in Lund in south of Sweden. Uh, I'm also an uh, associate professor of radiology. Uh, and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about, about this new, uh, uh, kind of new at least, uh, endovascular option for uh, chronic subdural treatment. Uh, and. Um, Johan, uh, we can see. actually see uh, the presenter mode. So we could also see the next slide. Oh my God. Uh, let me see. Maybe I can change that because that's going to be confusing. How about now? 
Yeah. Okay. Yes, now it's perfect. Thank you. Uh, good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, so let's see if I can move forward. Yes. Uh, so here are my disclosures. Um, what's relevant for this talk is that I've been a, a speaker for Balt and Metronic. They are making the glue that I'm going to show later. So I would, uh, if you allow me, I would give you a few uh, uh, suggestions on why you would want to consider an endovascular approach for uh, treating chronic subdurals. Uh, the first is that uh, uh, you would be treating um, the underlying cause of the disease. Uh, at least that's uh, that's how we. What is this? I'm so sorry. Let me see. There you go. Uh, you would be treating the underlying cause of the disease. Um, second reason is that there is a now a safe and effective endovascular procedure that uh, that you can use. Third uh, reason would be uh, that this endovascular uh, uh, procedure can actually reduce the recurrence rate uh, of the population uh, quite significantly. Fourth reason, and this uh, uh, taps in a lot on what Timo talked about uh, epidemiology, that because you don't need to stop any antithrombotic uh, medication when you do endovascular treatment. So this is beneficial for the large part of this patient group that now is on oral anticoagulation or uh, antiplatelet uh, uh, for, for good reasons. Um, maybe there is no need to drill at all in some cases or when you don't need. I will not suggest you to stop drill, but uh, if there are reasons against uh, drilling, uh, this might be a good option for you. And the last course uh, to make you room in your OR. So uh, handling these one by one, uh, both uh, uh, Timo and Jiri has, uh, has uh, shown this really well. Uh, so I will not go through this in detail, but just to conclude that it, it seems that even though there is an, uh, a first event, which is a, a, a traumatic uh, injury to the head, then the sequence of events uh, makes it so that this hematoma is actually self-generating and, and just removing the hematoma may not be enough uh, to prevent it from, from reoccur. Uh, it's uh, potentially so that the endovascular treatment uh, can, uh, in a better way, addresses this underlying uh, cause of the disease by closing the vessels that are uh, supporting this uh, edema and this uh, chronic subdural hematoma. So you uh, put a plug in that tube and uh, maybe you won't get the hematoma back or uh, the, well, we don't, if we do only endovascular, you don't even take it out, you allow the body to resorb it. Uh, but just uh, by stopping the influx, uh, you may be able to treat it. And, uh, most important, uh, reduced recurrence. So for do so, those of you who are not familiar with the endovascular um, procedure, this will be a short uh, uh, drawing uh, exposure of how that treatment is actually done. And there are um, a couple of different technical choices you can uh, make. Uh, you can use femoral excess, uh, and you can also use the radial axis. Uh, today, in, in uh, interventional neuroradiology, uh, radial approach is, is gaining popularity. And this is uh, definitely something that could be considered for these patients. Uh, the two main technical uh, alternatives otherwise are to embolize with particles, uh, which is exactly what it is, small particles. We use it to embolize nose bleeds and meningiomas, uh, for example, um, uh, or we can use liquid embolics. That's a, a nice uh, way to say that it's a fancy glue. It's an expensive glue. Uh, and um, you can also choose by local and general anesthesia. It's uh, 
uh, something like a 30 to 60 minute procedure. I would argue that it's more of a 60 minute procedure, uh, but nevertheless, it's, uh, it's, it has a, it, it, it's not a super complicated procedure. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a high success rate and, uh, and you learn this uh, quite, quite uh, quick. I think this will be one of the first procedures that the residents now will learn in interventional radiology. Uh, so for those of you who are uh, considering a career in interventional neurosurgery, this could be something to consider also. You can treat the patient uh, on one side or you can treat them on both sides. It, uh, it, it, it's, uh, uh, it works really well to, pay, uh, to treat them bilaterally. And you can do the treatment, of course, alone, or you can do it as an adjuvant to surgical evacuation. So uh, when you treat, if you treat with uh, PVA particles, uh, the treatment is, this is a, an angiogram, uh, and this is the middle meningeal artery. And when you treat with PVA particles, uh, you place a guide, guide catheter in the um, external carotid artery, and you catheterize the middle meningeal artery, but you can be quite proximal when you do this. And then you embolize the particles and they will travel with the blood and uh, get stuck uh, in the distal smaller branches of the vessel. And uh, eventually you will have filled the, the vascular bed and then you see a contrast stagnation in the vessel and then you know that you have done your embolization and you withdraw the catheter. Uh, you don't see the actual particles. You don't know uh, that they are there. Uh, if you instead choose for um, liquid embolics uh, or glue, uh, you typically uh, give that with a little bit smaller catheter and you place that further, uh, more distal, so something like this. And then you inject the glue and you embolize the, uh, the branches. And if you uh, are so distal that you miss uh, one or two branches, you can recatheterize that and, and do a second embolization for that. Then you withdraw the catheter uh, and you of course leave the glue and then you have something like this, which is the end result. Uh, uh, there are some anatomical consideration and I will not go into this in detail, uh, what, uh, what can be concluded from this. And this is uh, beautifully described in several uh, papers such as this one from uh, Bonasia um, uh, just a couple of years ago. What, what can be concluded is that these anatomical variations that are making embolization difficult or impossible or, uh, diff or, or dangerous, they are generally rare and they are in most cases associated with the lack of the foramen spinosum. So uh, you don't need to do angiography CT angiography, for example, to find these uh, anomalies, you can just look at the uh, bottom of the skull, and if there is a foramen spinosum, uh, you are good to go. So I will not go into great details to this either, but there are a, a, somewhat of a debate between which technique uh, is the, the preferred one. And it will probably show eventually because there is a, a lot of studies going on, uh, on uh, in this area right now. Um, so there are benefits to use PVA particles, but more and more centers uh, think that there are maybe a bigger advantage to use liquid embolics or glue. Um, mainly because it uh, gives a permanent occlusion of the vessel segment, whereas the particles uh, can be recandalized by the body, um, which is a beneficial uh, feature, for example, when we embolize for nose bleeds. Uh, but in this area, it's, it may not be beneficial because it may be that uh, the resorption of the hematoma uh, does not, uh, is not complete uh, when the vessel is recandalized and then the patient may have recurrence. Um, so uh, as, as uh, Yiri showed, this is a field uh, that has gained uh, tremendous interest just a couple of, just the last couple of years. 
some of it is uh, due to the, in, the interest in the endovascular treatment, which, uh, uh, which is uh, really uh, high uh, at the moment. So I will just uh, cite a few, a few of these uh, studies that I think uh, are of great value in this. Uh, one of them, the, one of the first one uh, from Kim, uh, showed in uh, 43 uh, retreatments in, in previously operated subdurals, uh, a very low recurrence rate uh, compared to, to surgery. This is a high uh, recurrence rate for surgery, but this is page, this is, these are all recurrence uh, cases to begin with. So it's uh, probably a reason. Um, uh, in, a, in another study by Ban, uh, they treated 72 de novo uh, uh, cases. Uh, and uh, quite a few of them were treated with only embolization. Uh, and they had a, a, a very high, they had also quite a high uh, recurrence rate for surgery, but the, the recurrence rate for uh, embolization combined with surgery or embolization alone was, was very low. Uh, and uh, finally, you see something else, something similar in, in this, uh, which was a prospective uh, cohort uh, by Shotar uh, in 2020. Uh, and this was uh, selected patients uh, based on a, uh, deemed to have a high risk of recurrence because they were on um, oral anticoagulation, dural antiplatelet, uh, uh, they had recurrences uh, or they were had uh, alcohol uh, uh, use or things like that for liver disease. And uh, for that group, they also showed that the recurrence rate for embolization was also low. So in in conclusion, it seems like the uh, recurrence rate for endovascular may be at least lower than 5%. I thought I had a different, another slide here. Maybe not. Okay, so uh, this is uh, um, uh, a case illustrating, I think this is I think this is the first case we actually did in, in, in Lund. Uh, we had been discussing to, to start this treatment uh, for, for, for some time, but we hadn't really uh, come around to start it. Um, now, uh, this um, was a man who, had, uh, who was an oral anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation, 74 years. He had a chronic subdural, uh, bilateral chronic subdural, uh, that's the left uh, side here, after a bicycle accident. Uh, people tend to bike in uh, Illund. Uh, so uh, his oral anticoagulation was put on hold. Then he had on the right side uh, a progress on the left side at follow up, and he was offered surgical evacuation. Uh, so surgic surgery was performed. But then immediately after surgery, he didn't wake up uh, and he was brought to CT uh, to, to see what was going on, if there was a re-bleeding or something like that. Uh, and what you see then is that there is a large dense uh, vessel here in the basilar artery and the basilar artery is missing on the angiographic images. So what had occurred here was that uh, he got a, an embolus, um, probably uh, due partly to the uh, cessation of his uh, oral anticoagulation. So anyway, uh, that brought him to us uh, and uh, um, um, my colleague Matthias uh, treated him and started of course by taking out the basilar uh, thrombus. Uh, and then um, when we had him uh, uh, on the table, we also um, decided to go for uh, embolization. So uh, we embolized him uh, with the, you see the, the glue casts here. So he got a bilateral uh, embolization. And um, this, oh uh, no, it just was the, that was the next patient, I'm sorry. And back this one. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so this is the, at the three months follow-up, so uh, 
he apparently survived the bachelor occlusion and uh, he's, uh, he also did, did well, uh, at least radiologically, with uh, a good uh, resol uh, resol resolution of this uh, bilateral uh, subdural. So the next uh, reason why you could consider an endovascular option would be this, that you sometimes don't want to drill uh, even if you are a neurosurgeon. And this was one such case. <laughs> uh, so this was a 82 year old man. He had uh, uh, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. Uh, then he also had a chronic subdural uh, after minor trauma. And uh, he also had a, a, a shunt uh, uh, previously. He had quite mild symptoms and uh, there was a fear that uh, surgery for the for the subdural could compromise the DBS, uh, so uh, we chose uh, also an uh, embolization for him, and this was done via radial approach. It doesn't, uh, of course, affect the uh, result uh, in the brain, but uh, reduces maybe the femoral complications. So uh, it's this guy, and he got this uh, glue cast here for for the parietal branches of the MMA on the left side. Uh, and uh, I think he was treated also uh, on the other side. Um, and this is uh, him at the three months follow-up. So you see he got to keep all his, uh, his stuff uh, and uh, he also resolved the uh, uh, hematoma. And uh, yeah, this is this has also been addressed uh, by Timo uh, and Lieri before. So it's uh, it's this is a, a rapidly increasing uh, entity now, and it's uh, like Lieri said, it's the most common neurosurgical procedure. So uh, um, there may be uh, a good that may be a good time to also opt for an endovascular option for at least some of these patients. Uh, Uh, yeah, okay, so I'm getting back to this. Uh, so there are some support for uh, embolization alone, uh, although most of the previous work being done uh, is in uh, association with surgery to prevent uh, recurrence. Uh, but uh, there are some, some data for, uh, or quite a lot of data actually also for embolization alone, um, given that it's a quite new uh, development still. Uh, so, like I said, um, so in this study by Khan from 2020, they showed that the only EMBA only uh, retreatment rate was 6.5%. So it's it's quite low, uh, and this is a group of it's a retrospective uh, study uh, on 138 patients. Uh, Shotar that I mentioned before. Um, uh, it's probably well it probably doesn't really belong here but Dian uh, had a meta-analysis and in in that case in, in this group there was quite a lot of embolization only patients and the recurrence rate was also quite low so uh, there are some data that suggest that embolization alone may have uh, a recurrence rate that is as low as when you do embolization in uh, as an adjunctive to uh, surgery uh, there are a, a lot of knowledge gaps, uh, especially in the endovascular uh, field, and I, this is uh, not comprehensive at all. There are lots of stuff to to research about, but some of them that I would like to mention, and uh, one such thing is volumetric measurement of, of chronic subdural. It's actually quite difficult to measure the volume of the subdural hematoma, and it's uh, I don't think it's uh, I don't think anyone is doing it in clinical routine. I think this will be in, in important as a pseudo marker for for technical success. Uh, in, in, so, so we are developing that, and I think the industry is is developing uh, uh, easy tools for doing that. Uh, technical success grading. That's uh, 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 like Yiri said. There is uh, sort of a, a lack of uh, common standards in this field, and uh, in the endovascular field also. 
very much so. And one such thing is the technique of success grade. And I think we have learned from the endovascular treatment of stroke, where we use the uh, MTC scale to show how, uh, how good the recanalization was. And in, in this case, I think we need to find some common ground for a scale that can show how effective the, or how complete the embolization was. Um, prognostication uh, will be very important after endovascular uh, treatment, of course. Um, hopefully, we can we can do that in the in in, in uh, many of the studies that are ongoing. That we can uh, maybe find markers so that we know that if uh, the treatment is uh, effective, for example, uh, then the risk we we can find the predictors of recurrence. Uh, and uh, as I said before, endovascular treatment alone uh, uh, as an alternative to surgery, that is uh, quite interesting because uh, uh, since the numbers are increasing, we don't really want to just add one more treatment to all of the patients. We would uh, rather prefer to do a minimally invasive treatment for those patients that, uh, that would do well from that and uh, save surgery for those that need that. Um, and there are several RCTs ongoing, uh, but most of them, uh, well, uh, I think last time we checked, uh, are comparing endovascular uh, as an adjunctive uh, treatment following surgical evacuation. Uh, and we think that uh, this, uh, since there are quite a lot of uh, retrospective data, we think it justifies a, an RCT for embolization only uh, versus surgery uh, for uh, symptomatic uh, subdurals. Uh, so we have, uh, we have uh, initiated such a trial and we have actually started it uh, in a small scale uh, in Lund. So uh, these are patients that uh, are being offered surgery for by the neurosurgeons. They can participate in the trial, and uh, they have to uh, they have to come uh, pass some security tests. So you could say that if the patient is in need of a uh, urgent um, hematoma evacuation because the symptoms are so great. Uh, then for safety reasons, we don't include them or offer them inclusion into this uh, uh, trial. So there are a list of requirements for safety that they need to fulfill. Uh, other than that, um, we um, randomized these patients uh, uh, one by one, uh, one to one, and uh, uh, half of them are embolized and half of them are evacuated uh, surgically. And then we'll follow them up at uh, three months with the head CT and the questionnaires. Uh, so this uh, uh, trial is now uh, uh, ongoing. The protocol of the trial was recently published in trials. And um, yeah, so these are the, I will not go into this in detail, uh, but uh, there are some exclusion criteria, mainly addressing the safety issue that, uh, that I mentioned. Um, and we are now uh, uh, we now have uh, several other Swedish centers that are interested. In that we hope uh, that they are able to join uh, now this winter, hopefully, and then we will try to add new centers uh, as as best we can to be able to finish this uh, trial. I, th I think it uh, gives an important addition to to this question whether uh, embolization alone can be an alternative for for uh, some of these patients. Uh, so this is the uh, team uh, that working on this uh, trial uh, in in Lund, and um, uh, Matthias Drake, who's in the middle, who's a colleague of mine, is. Uh, uh, you, and and if you are interested to participate in this study, we would love that, and uh, you are very happy to to reach out to 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 me or him or or Niklas Marklun if you know him or um, and. Uh, that's it from me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Han. Very interesting.
Okay, maybe we'll tackle the Q&A section now because there's a lot of questions piling up. 32 currently. So I think we'll try to actually answer all of these in the sake of time, of course. But the first one is what are methods to prevent recurrence? So uh, I can answer first, then you can add Yuan and uh, Iri if you have something. But I guess the most solid things that we know about that actually are effective in, uh, in lowering the rate of recurrence is the uses of drains. Is it subdural or subgallial? Is it passive or do you have some suction in it? That's debatable, but drains that you use reduce the rate of recurrence. That's pretty solid evidence. Uh, there's some factors that we can't affect, like uh, the hematoma vo volume or bilaterality or male gender that uh, increase the recurrence rate, but we can't actually treat those, of course. But do you have, Johan or Iri, something to add to that? Um, yeah, I agree uh, that drains are probably the most solid uh, solid based evidence right now. Um, I argue that if you irrigate, based on the study that we did here in Sweden, you should use um, warm saline, that is body temperature saline, that's uh, also uh, quite significant in terms of uh, reducing the recurrent numbers. Um, that's probably the two main ones. Then there are different ones that are different aspects of the surgical treatment that can obviously be debated. Uh, but I'd say that uh, drains and warm saline uh, are probably the most uh, solid ones. I agree. We're working on yeah. that irrigation, no irrigation study in Finland. So that's why I don't uh, market the irrigation because we're going to publish the results uh, early next year, I think. So it's going to be interesting what's going to gonna come out. But I'm not convinced that irrigation is so effective, but I don't know the results. So let's let's wait wait for those. But you can please, if you have something that. No, I'm, uh, thank you. I, I agree. I, I think that... Uh... These uh, will be the patients that you may want to opt for uh, an endovascular option first. Uh, so if you have uh, patients uh, uh, with high risk of recurrence, so that is patients that already had a recurrence before, for example, uh, maybe as a second line, you would want to have patients that you definitely don't want to take off their oral ambriculation. Uh, for example, if they had a serious stroke or something like that. Um, then maybe you could discuss whether you you would opt for bilateral uh, uh, chronic subdurals like a third group. Uh, yeah, good. Okay, there's the second question is, could you comment on MMA embolization on chronic subdural hematomas? I think that question was pretty good covered already. And the third one, uh, do you use uh, prophylactic anti seizures for all patients, and uh, I'll answer answer from our department. No, we don't use. We don't have that routine. If the patient already has epilepsy and has a medication, we don't pause that. But we don't use prophylactic or post op uh, anti epileptics. And I don't. I'm not aware of any evidence that supports the routine use of anti epileptic drugs in chronic subdural hematomas. But guys, please add if you have some uh, wise answers to this. Yeah, no, I agree with you, Timo, completely. There's actually a there's a there's a Cochrane review just uh, published a quite a couple of years back on specifically that subject or topic, basically whether or not to put on prophylactic anti-epileptic drugs on patients with chronic surgery hematoma presenting without seizures, right? And, and there is no evidence out there to, to support that. So, so we don't do that either, uh, unless, of course, the patients do present with seizures, then it's a different thing, but otherwise, no. Okay, then we'll move on. Do you remove the inner brain layer of the fibrous capsule of the chronic subdural hematoma? Uh, if you do a burr hole, it's pretty impossible to do any capsulectomy, but the, uh, in my knowledge, it isn't beneficial. It's even, it can be even harmful to somehow try to remove the inner capsule. 
and uh, we don't do it in Finland. I don't know that any of our five centers do it uh, as a routine. And if it's even debatable in the complicated cases that have uh, multiple recurrences that you should go for a craniotomy and do a membranectomy, I, I don't know that that's beneficial. And uh, please guys comment if you have something on this. Uh, no, nothing on my part either. It's there is no uh, no evidence whatsoever to support the the, the uh, what's called the visceral membrane, right? To to basically to try to puncture that. Uh, but uh, I know that is a tradition, and that's something that's been done previously. But as you say, Tim, we, I think it's uh, kind of risky, and in modern day single burr hole surgery, it, it's almost impossible uh, unless you you uh, yeah. If you attempt, you might end up actually uh, damaging the brain. So I agree. Yep. It, for endovascular, it has been suggested as uh, as a sort of a, a marker for uh, patients that would be more suitable for embolization. Uh, but there are no re uh, really good data for that. And, and uh, I'm not sure it's going to move. I, I, I Personally, I don't think it's going to move that way. Uh, so good okay and then there's a other question on the anti-epileptics but i think we covered that already but th then there's a question on uh, day drains and how many days and uh, uh Yuri already covered this uh one to two days is the mainstay i think and uh we're using one day sometimes two days uh, one could argue that there's no like average day or hour amount that you should use routinely because uh, some patients have a very enlarged post-op cavity, cavity that the brain doesn't enlarge and fill the cavity and it takes more time that the brain actually elevates to cover that dead space and I would uh, argue that those cases would benefit from a longer drain period, but there's no solid evidence to support that theory. But uh, I think in the Nordic countries, one to two days is that, that what we use and uh, the evidence quite supports that also. Giri, do you want to add something? No, I, I completely agree from a surgical point of view. I mean, it's um, the, the studies that are out there. I mean, the mainstay study or the, the main, mostly highly cited one is the Centurius. They used the, the drain, uh, the subdural drain only for 48 hours. I think this is probably all, still the norm in many European countries, especially the UK. But as the Danes showed in their large RCT, uh, there is no need for for keeping the drains in place for 48 hours, 24 hours are, are good enough. Then the question is obviously, okay, does it apply even when you use other drain types? Uh, and uh, possibly even is there a possibility that you can actually, uh, you know, uh, it, it can be enough with, let's say, six or 12 hours of drainage, but nobody has answered that so far. So, so I'd say that 24 hours should be the norm as a rule of thumb. Yeah. Good. And then there's a question about uh, irrigation. Uh, how often do you flush the superall space? Does it have a role in recurrence? And if you don't do a washout, how about re conservative management of chronic subdurals, watchful waiting? So there's actually two questions on it. So about irrigation, uh, it's, it's part of the routine uh, surgical regimen currently in many centers, but there's, as we said, there's one finished study looking at specifically irrigation or no irrigation. So there's questions out there and we'll have some more solid answers on that, but uh, is it beneficial? If yes, use body temperature irrigation. And that's the main thing to do now currently. And about the other, other question, what's conservative management of CSD? Okay, so what, okay, you don't operate, that's conservative treatment, but mainly uh, I think, if, if you, you would somehow uh, take that topic uh, more widely is that uh, which cases should be managed conservatively. So I think in history, 
uh, surgeons were more keen on looking at the size of the hematoma and, and uh, treating the hem hematoma itself and not so much looking at the symptoms. Now the guidelines are that uh, just treat the symptomatic ones, not only the of course, you, have, you should have a hematoma that has some mass effect and combined with symptoms, but don't just treat the hematoma itself. So at least in our center, we treat conservatively those cases that are asymptomatic, although the hematoma could be quite large. Of course, it happens that we see that patient coming in again within one to two weeks because the hematoma enlarges and symptoms develop. But Initially, we try to manage those patients conservatively, and that we could call that watchful waiting, but we don't schedule a routine CT scan for those cases. We go by symptoms. So if the patient develops symptoms, we say to the healthcare centers and the patient back if they develop symptoms. That's our, our management regimen. Same here. Same here. Okay, let's go on. Um, how soon following surgery of chronic subdurals do you start prophylactic anticoagulation? How soon do you restart antiplatelets, anticoagulants? Uh, we have a routine one month post injury. We pause the blood thinners not um, much evidence on that. There's a bit like rising evidence that you should keep it as short as possible. One, I, I looked at one recent large study that noted that you shouldn't start it before three days passed up and you should start it at least at the three week time point. So somewhere in between. So I think we're more prone on, on using longer periods instead of shorter ones. And we could be more active on starting those. There's not a lot of evidence on if you start it soon that that actually increases the incidence of recurrence. There's some papers that say that it, it does, but it's not a consensus. I agree with you, Timo. We even, I think it's important in this context to look at the what, what's called the risk stratification, right? So, so you look at the indication for the for the therapy, uh, whether or not it's a it's an indication, let's say a, a high risk patient, such as one with a mechanical heart valve or something like that, when you have a very high risk of strokes if you're without, uh, let's say, a warfarin or whatever. Then probably three days is, is a good rule of thumb um, with some sort of bridging therapy, a low molecule weight heparin in between or something like that. But if you have a, let's say you have your, your um, uh, uh, aspirin uh, treatment on an indication of uh, due to hypertension as a prophylactic, then you can obviously wait for three weeks, probably doesn't, wouldn't hurt you and, and the risk of stroke would be minimal. But it's a very good question, and there is really no good answer. Uh, I'll argue that, as Timo said, somewhere between three days and three weeks, depending on indication for the for the antithrombotics, um, uh, and that's probably the way to go right now. And and I know there are several larger studies, uh, upcoming studies, on trying to solve exactly this question. So maybe in a couple of years we'll know the answer. Yeah, good. And the next one is on follow-up CT scanning after operation of chronic subdural. So when do you perform uh, first CT and do you perform a CT before or after drain removal? So Yuri, if you can answer something on this first. Yeah, so I mean, uh, looking at our own practice here, we, we don't do any control CTs, uh, neither the day after surgery, before or after drain removal, uh, nor follow-up. Okay, so we just follow the patient uh, on a clinical basis. Um, and, and at least in terms of the, the longer-term follow-up CT in, let's say, four weeks or six weeks after surgery, there is the New England Journal of Medicine paper that, that tells you that you shouldn't do that. That's actually counterproductive. Uh, in terms of a uh, CT being done the day after surgery or before or after drain removal, 
can be debatable, uh, but that's not something that's evidence based to do so. And I, at least in our own practice, and uh, I, we we, uh, we we don't do that. To be to be honest. Yeah, I agree. It, we have the same practice, so no routine scanning. Only if there's a certain question, clinical relevant question, we do, but not not routinely. Johan, do you have any any comments on uh, control scanning as a radiologist? No, uh, I, I think that's very good uh, uh, opportunity to bring that up. And uh, it's really uh, important being a radiologist. It's easy to say that you should always do a, a CT or always check, but uh, it makes sense to to study this and, and uh, if it doesn't add anything uh, benefit any benefit to the patient it's probably good to leave it out um, I, I i would just i would guess that the same will go for endovascular treatment uh, since the recurrence rates are are at least uh, significantly lower the benefit of of follow-up ct would be even less for endovascular treatment okay very good Okay, we'll go on with the other questions. So is there data on drainage with low suction? So Iri, are you more familiar on, on the suction part? I know that there's some studies on it and some show benefit. Sure, but there's I mean, always the question on what's the pressure and how much suction and and uh, do you put a subgalea or subdural drain? I'm a, a bit afraid of complications if you do too much suction, but please comment. And I mean, you are right, and I agree. I mean, in terms of subdural drainage and suction, one might one might be afraid that that you will um, you know have some sort of complication in terms of. The brain being sucked up in, into the, the into the drain, right, or, or something similar to that. So I don't know many centers that use active suction when the drain is subdural. Uh, on the other side, if the drain is what's called subperistal, right, the other other type that's often used, many centers do. Uh, we do here in in Stockholm. Uh, we apply, we use the subperistal drainage, and we apply suction in terms of our like a small suction, not an active suction device, but a small uh, suction bulb, right? That you use in, in, in the ICU or similar. Uh, that doesn't uh, apply uh, too much of a pressure. So it's a mild pressure, I'd say. Um, and, and we haven't experienced, at least in the, the retrospective data says that we've published uh, any specific complications related to that. Then it's always the question, okay, does it help in terms of lowering the recurrence rate? Um, I would argue that there are no very good data sets out there to 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 uh, to support that. To be honest, it, it's too it's too um, let's say if you use active suction device, there's there's probably something else that the other team or other center that you're trying to compare your results with does differently. Okay, so there are no uniform treatments where this has been evaluated specifically, but you can yes, but then probably. The, the short question, short answer would be yes. You can use active uh, suction. Yes, it it uh, at our center we have a recurrence rate around ten percent, and this is what you can compare it to. Very good. And then there's a few questions about membranes. Uh, in personal experience, do you open the viscoral capsula and septa of the CSD8 uh, and visualize the brain and arachnoid membrane? And then there's other question, do you take off both membranes or just one? And at our center, and as I've been taught by very senior neurosurgeons, uh, always we you do a burr hole evacuation. We just open a few sips that we can see from the burr hole if they just come to your missile site and puncture that, not the one that's in the surface of the brain, but it's what's superficial to that. You can open that and sometimes you get more fluid out of the whole subdural space after that, but nothing extreme, nothing, nothing extensive. So just a few little punctures, that's the max that we do. And I think that's wise and we don't have any complications related to just opening a small hole in a, Sip that actually comes to your visual field.
Yeah, no comment from from my side. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll go on because we're losing time. So, how much time do we have? Do we, have no, we don't have a limit, but uh, we'll try to end this within the next ten to fifteen minutes. Um, how about transformation from burr hole to craniectomy due to activation of chronic into an acute one? How often does it happen and why? Um, I don't know from the science part, the rates, but it's considered extremely rare that you get such a blown out bleed that when you irrigate that you don't get anything more than just fresh blood or even coagulated stuff. And it actually is a very like big acute, acute bleed. It's very rare. If I think of our, our center from the last 10 years, I don't remember even one case that we've treated that during surgery of a burr hole, like evacuation, that it would be converted to a craniotomy. So I would say that it's very, very, very rare. I agree. I don't have the exact numbers, but it's very rarely happens. Uh, but if it does, I agree based on the comment that yes, if you have a acute uh, um, re-bleed, it's usually what's called, right? Then you should do a craniotomy or a small craniotomy to, to address that. Okay, then the next one, is there any evidence to guide one versus two burr holes in specifically patients on antiplatelet anticoagulants or with suboptimal clotting function? So how many holes do you make to the head if the patient has somehow disrupted coagulation status? Uh, I don't know answer to this. Is there any, any studies that have focused on this? Uh, no, no recollection. Uh, the short answer is no, uh, but uh, if if you, um, I mean, in terms of the recurrence rate, if if you're thinking patients, at least according to the meta-analysis data that's out there, if you do one versus two burr holes, it should be equal, right? So one might ask, okay, why do the second burr hole? It seems to be redundant, but obviously there can be specific cases where you can use two burr holes. Let's say you have a septated hematoma with two compartments where you might think in that specific case, it might play a role. I, I can understand that, but on a, on a general terms, I wouldn't advise uh, you know, performing two burr holes if, unless it's specifically necessary in that specific case. Yeah, I agree. Uh, could you use an endoscope? Uh, uh, could the use of an endoscope be beneficial in uh, chronic subdurals with membranes or clots? Some studies have looked at it and some centers that have a lot of experience with endoscopes feel that it's beneficial and it could be utilized in, in uh, actually opening the septus. Of course, you should have a very large hematoma that you have a cavity where you can put in the scope. We don't have experience in our center on this, but uh, I would say shortly that it could be beneficial but needs more studies. Uh, does it change the tactics when there are sips. Okay, we've talked about that already. Any evidence about opening inner membrane with and higher epileptic seizure risk? Uh, I don't know about studies, but you could argue that if you somehow interrupt the surface of the brain, even trying to remove the membrane, that you can cause damage to the brain tissue and it can cause seizures. Not much scientific evidence on that, but don't call, don't touch the inner membrane, I would say. <laughs> and uh, how do you manage chronic subdurals with membranes? And there's all, why is combination of small craniotomy at the thickest part of the hematoma with opening of membranes and a burr hole at the most posterior part not mentioned? So somebody's actually thinking about doing like a, a larger opening and then a mo smaller one to other part if there's separate compartments. 
not the approach that we would use in Finland. And of course, if if the specifics of the case and the and the uh, form of the hematoma would actually demand you to do that, why not? But is there a benefit for it? As Yuri said, I, I wouldn't feel strongly that there's a benefit for the patient on that. Um, I'm looking at if there's something new, some new topics that we haven't actually discussed. I like, if I might comment, I like the one on the anticoagulation. Uh, how would you deal with anticoagulation in the case of no follow-up? In most cases, we stop the medication for four to six weeks. Then you do a CT, and based on the CT, you decide if the patient can be reinstated, right, on the antithrombotics. Yeah. So my my question to provoke that comment would be: so when when are you satisfied with the CT result? Okay, because there is absolutely no evidence on this. So are you satisfied if if the hematoma is completely uh, resorbed, or do you accept a uh, three millimeter, five millimeter, one centimeter? Uh, uh, you know, uh, hematoma uh, cavity remaining at the follow-up CT in order to reinstate antithrombotics, okay? Because there is no easy answer to that. Uh, it's it's a subjective basis from surgeon to surgeon. So so it would be the, so the, the I mean, the it's difficult to, to um, there's no evidence basically pointing in the direction that you you can do Either way, okay. So, so, so it's like a, again a CT that you can do, and it might guide you, but it will be on a subjective basis. Yeah, and then, as you said, what, when you are you satisfied with the CT scan? Uh, uh, all of us have some cases that you followed up super long, and it takes forever for the hematoma to resolve, and uh, that's a point to consider. And uh, and. About the follow-ups uh, in terms, uh, I don't know what's in, in Sweden and other countries, what's the policy if you think of follow-up and what happens at the follow-ups. When you operate a chronic subdural, what do you do with the driving license? Do you suspend the driving license in Sweden? Uh, yeah, we usually do for, for a couple of months, three months. Roughly. Yeah. What happens after that? Do you do a clinical follow-up? and then give them the driving license back or what's the policy? Uh, that's a very good question. So, so in this, this case, we usually outsource that part to the, <laughs> to the, to the general practitioner. Um, I'm not saying it's a good way to do it. I'm just saying that usually we are not the ones that follow up that part. Uh, sometimes the neurologists at the local departments do that as well to help us. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, because those are the cases that sometimes it's a, if it's a very old case, okay, then you're gonna say that it, it's it, you're done, you don't drive anymore. <laughs> but uh, you have the younger cases, middle age, uh, the non frequent cases, uh, middle age chronic subdural cases that you you have to suspend the driving license, and they they have quite a lot of symptoms a few days after surgery they're recovering and you're worried that what's what's going to be the outcome like within what usually we suspend the driving license one month so we many times follow up those cases at our clinic and sometimes uh, if there's if those cases even have some blood thinners then we can argue that we should do a scan to make sure that they're recovering radiology radiologically also and then think about the whole combination of blood thinner continuation and also driving license ETC. So in these kind of cases, we're still actually doing follow-ups. Selvä. Some, some, Löysin some, verkosta some tällaista scans. haula. Faces. Siri joined the conversation. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go on to a quick questions if there's something new still there there's a lot of from about membranes i think there are some questions for johan now some uh, on embolization maybe you can you can how, how does embolization results in recovery of defects it's risk comparison surgical it's a bit awkward question but i i think the question is on recovery yeah. 
I think so. And uh, what's been what's what's been reported uh, is that uh, the recovery uh, because there is all you don't take the hematoma out, and th therefore the resolution of the symptoms may be gradual over like a, a month or even a couple of months. That's why we don't uh, typically uh, select patients with severe symptoms from 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 uh, uh, mass effects by the hematomas. Uh, uh, other than that, uh, it's most of the patients uh, uh, improve uh, within a couple of weeks, uh, and then they have a steady steady recovery. But the hematoma is going to be there for for several months, gradually decreasing. Yeah, good. Was there anything else on endovascular that you could? Uh, I don't see any specific ones on endovascular. Yeah, I think we've covered pretty much all the central parts. There's some additional questions maybe that we didn't cover, but I think we've covered all the main pitfalls that are somehow raised up in the questions. And I, I think we've used so much time already that we can wrap up. And uh, I thank Johan and Thierry for the excellent webinar and good talks. And thank you for all the participants on the questions. Uh, it was very thought provoking and I think this gave uh, a lot of good knowledge to all of us. Thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. And good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye.